Okay. Is it faster? Can you hear me? Is no. Thank you. Can you hear me fine, or is it too close, too far? Seems good. Okay, let me see. Okay, uh, Lorenz Reveal will be telling us about the third path that uh, Daniel Adar alluded to, dynamically corrected gates. Okay, uh, so I'd like to start off saying that it is a big pleasure for me to be back here four years after, and uh, well, from my point of view, obviously I'd like to tell you something of the work uh, that I've been doing uh, in between, and uh, this is about uh, trying to extend the principles which underlie dynamical decoupling to how to uh, correct uh, non-trivial quantum gates. So that's probably something that you can guess already from my title. And that's what I want to focus on, but in the spirit of uh, uh, trying to describe a little bit uh, um, the bigger context, let me just uh, say a few words on what this morning Daniel gave a nice tutorial on uh, what I like to consider the simplest possible setting of dynamical QEC. The D is meant to distinguish it from the standard QEC on which we also had a beautiful tutorial this morning. Um, so uh, dynamical quantum error correction stands for a purely non-dissipative form of uh, error correction. And from the point of view of control, uh, this is done, as uh, Daniel already emphasized, purely by uh, open loop engineering of typically an open system Hamiltonian that we can do in the simplest possible case by means of a finite repertoire of unitary operations, pulses, that we apply to our system and leave the environment untouched. Um, I would like to stress once again, because it's kind of easy to let it uh, go, um, to forget it when we get uh, fully immersed in the math, what physical principle that enables all of these DQEC uh, techniques of which dynamical decoupling and now very soon dynamically corrected gate or dynamically protected gates as well uh, operate upon. And that physical principle is essentially a separation of time scales. Uh, that means we have heard already about the importance of frequency cutoff. That means that uh, the noise, the noisy degrees of freedom that we are trying to remove the influence on our system from they are associated with a finite correlation time scales over which basically they can be considered as being approximately frozen in time so that the whole evolution can be seen as a coherent evolution and as such we can intervene actively from the outside and we can use coherent control methods to effectively undo the bad things just like in the race tracing um, picture that Daniel was showing and ever coherently over time the unwanted effects. So from the mathematical point of view, I can't see this pointer, but uh, if you do, I'm okay. Uh, that also means that there is uh, going to be a natural small parameter in the problem, which is the ratio between uh, the time scale for the correlation of the noisy degrees of freedom versus uh, the time scale, the typical uh, time scale of the control we are going to act. And that uh, enables a lot of the perturbative analysis upon which we uh, rely on to be uh, performed. So uh, DQEC then, that's the broad context. I actually started working in dynamical decoupling quite a few years ago, 97. Um, and in those days, um, well, the emphasis, at least for me and many people, were like a lot of understanding how, in principle, it could be done. Not so much or not anymore uh, these days where my effort has been more and more towards trying to make this method practical. And uh, uh, it is in this spirit that I like to uh, put uh, both my talk, but before, let me say a couple of words on another related talk, very related one by uh, Kaveko Juste, who is uh, also here in the audience, and also Mike Birsek is here. Um, so I've been mentioning, uh, well, the goal is to try to close the gap between theory and experiments and making DQEC as practical as possible. And in the process of doing so, what we have to face is unavoidable limitations due to system uh, non-idealities, due to control constraints, and so on and so forth. So uh, here is the first set of, uh, of goals that I've been looking at in terms of how to better address uh, timing and sequencing constraints that uh, are present even in those control scenarios where uh, approximation 
of having purely instantaneous pulses, which has been referred to as uh, bang bang approximation, as you know, uh, can still be uh, considered as accurate. So if that even in the scenarios where that can be uh, true, it is still uh, a fact that uh, uh, pulses cannot be applied infinitely fast, so there is a minimum uh, switching time, there is a finite repetition rate, and then brings along a lot of questions uh, on which we are starting to have answers. So in particular, question is like, what are the ultimate, uh, even in the absence of any kinds of other imperfection, but just in the presence of this fundamental limitation, how well can ever pulsed dynamical decoupling method do? So that's one question that uh, we have been addressing. And similarly, once we are able to find out a fundamental limitation or a best possible coherence level, for instance, we can reach um, for a qubit or a system of our choice, can that uh, coherence level be achieved for no matter how long we would like it to be? So how important is the final storage time in this? And can we therefore have also um, arbitrarily good long time uh, storage? Another type of constraint, which um, actually I, I have to be very thankful to my uh, collaborator, Mike Lipsek, for bringing this uh, to our attention because I think it hasn't been considered uh, sufficiently so far is that as uh, implementation will scale up, uh, the complexity on sequencing will also become an important consideration and so we will have to design uh, decoupling sequences and uh, down the line also DQEC schemes in such a way that they will be as compatible as possible with the constraints imposed by uh, digital electronics, clocking, and all of that. So this is not going to be my talk. My talk is going to focus instead mostly on another uh, constraint which is unavoidably present in practice because it is true that even though maybe the bang bang, the instantaneous control approximation can be a relatively good approximation, uh, realistic control amplitudes are never uh, infinite. So real life control action, they have finite energies, so real life pulses, they always have a duration. And this introduces from the design point of view, from the control point of view, a whole new set of challenges, well new, not that they haven't been looked uh, before because in NMR, as always, there is a lot of legacy coming from the NMR experience. They have been considered. But from the point of view of wanting to really have a systematic and general approach, that's what I want to look at. So the issues that comes about when we are looking at bound control inputs is like um, we are clearly picking up an error behavior. Decoherence happens also during the execution of a gate. So we have to uh, devise strategies which are not only going to give us a protected or decoupled memory, but also genuinely we have to come up with ways for removing decoherence as it happens in the moment we are processing information. So that is going to be uh, my main theme. Uh, for the rest of the talk, and uh, I want to stress that there have been a lot of related uh, ideas around, and I will build inspiration. I take inspiration both from strongly modulating pulses, composite pulses techniques in NMR. We have been referring to this approach as dynamically corrected gates, and uh, I apologize if some of you might have been in the Boulder workshop. You will hear some of the background on dynamically corrected gates and how to construct them. Uh, you will hear them a second time, but this is necessary for me because what I want to ask next is, well, once we have this tool, uh, which is pretty versatile in general, how can we make it even better than it is now? Namely, how can we make dynamically corrected gates more efficient and also more flexible in accommodating different type of other constraints? And what I would like to to mention here is nothing conclusive, but just our in progress work towards trying to merge the uh, formalism of dynamically corrected gates with tool from optimal control theory. So let me start by giving the essential background on dynamically corrected gates. Luckily, a lot of elements have been already reviewed this morning for me, so I am going to consider a target system which is in general, an open quantum system, namely, is going to interact with the quantum. So the Hamiltonian 
uh, will consist of a system component only, a bath component only, and the system uh, bath interaction. And we can always expand this without loss of, of generality in terms of system and bath operators. Um, and uh, it was already noticed um, this morning in Daniel's tutorial. In general, in DQEC approaches, we try to go with a minimal uh, assumptions in regard to the noise we are trying to fight. And indeed, at this level, I'm not going to assume much on these operators for the bath air, other than they are bounded in some uh, appropriate norm. And let me deal with the operator norm, uh, because that was just already mentioned. The environment is uncontrollable by definition. We are going to introduce open loop control via the action of certain control inputs, which are coupled to control Hamiltonians. And you will hear a lot uh, about this not in bath, the control propagator coming from the time order exponential of the control Hamiltonian. Now, what I want to stress, uh, because this will become relevant at some point in my talk, the system Hamiltonian, uh, the, the Hamiltonian that the system would have even if it would be isolated from the bath, uh, so the drift, um, as a twofold role, because depending on the type of gate that we are performing, it can either be an unwanted contribution, and in that regard, we treat it. We just treat it as another one, another type of error, even though it induces coherent evolution. In other systems, however, it might be that that very same uh, system Hamiltonian is necessary for us to have complete controllability in the first place. So keep in mind this as we will go through. Um, so, um, I am talking about dynamical correction, so error model that we have to define. Uh, the error in, in principle can include any deviation between uh, the actual controlled evolution we would like to impose on the system, uh, that we have on the system, and the intended evolution that we would have liked to get for that. So if the system and the bath would be uncoupled, we would get a, we would, uh, uh, get a certain unitary propagator given by uh, exponential of this. Uh, but in real life, the action of the same control in the presence of the error Hamiltonian, which is due to the coupling <coughs> um, with the bath, results into this more complicated object here. And what is going to become uh, very important, probably the most important uh, element for constructing or, well, for analyzing what is going to come next is that no matter how complicated this unitary propagator is, we can always view it as a, we can always isolate the error component by expressing it in terms of the ideal target gate that we would like to achieve times another unitary operator, which is going to call the, is, we are going to call it the error action. It is the exponential of an Hermitian system bath operator that appears here. And uh, physically, uh, what this um, effective Hamiltonian is, is not in bath. Uh, the effective Hamiltonian that we obtain by uh, effecting a canonical transformation into the toggling frame with respect to the applied control. Now, I am going for the moment to stick to two simplifying assumptions uh, for constructing DCGs. And uh, well, the first assumption is like the controller is not going to be uh, that to me, is not going to introduce additional errors. My only source of error is going to be the coherence here. And lastly, uh, I will effectively assume that uh, whatever the system Hamiltonian uh, does, uh, I don't need it for controllability, and therefore I will treat that as yet another unwanted piece of evolution. So for all practical purposes, I will, go into ref I will refer to this as a driftless system. Now, uh, this is simplifying my life because in this case, uh, the uh, controlled propagator is exactly equal to the target gate, and it just comes from the application of the control Hamiltonian. There is no term due to the system Hamiltonian here. And uh, as I was referring uh, to before, this is the error Hamiltonian, which is modulated by the control propagator. Now, uh, for uh, concreteness, let me focus on my target system consisting um, on a set of qubits, which are uh, interacting. Uh, this is the non-Markovian error correction setting. We are coupling with the bath. 
and the possible coupling operators are going to be arbitrary single qubit operators. This is the general decoherence model that uh, has been considered lots of times, and it's just uh, a typical one. So the set of error operators we wish to suppress, notice that in this framework, the error operator is really an operator on system times bath, um, is uh, having the Pauli operator in the system component and arbitrary operator in the bath. Okay, um, having defined an error model, I also need some sort of uh, a metric uh, of performance and having the error operator in place <coughs> uh, basically gives us a natural way to quantify the deviation between the actual and the intended evolution that we would like to have for our system. We call uh, R gate uh, the size, the norm, operator norm of an operator here, which is the error action up to irrelevant pure bath contribution that we just remove out, we project them away because they do not have a direct effect on the uh, evolution that we are interested at. So given this definition of the error per gate, uh, it is possible to prove that the distance, this is the uh, trace uh, distance between the actual state at the end of some evolution versus the ideal state we'd like to get is actually bounded by how large this mod B uh, is. So um, I will assume my task here is going to be uh, given I have uh, the given that I have the possibility to affect a universal set of gates uh, in a faulty way, uh, or basically uh, the way that the laboratory does it, uh, my task is going to, to be um, to devise a better way to perform them. So let me start uh, having uh, access to a set of single qubit and some uh, entangling two qubit operators. This is just an example. I don't have to stick to those, but it's one that you can keep in mind for concreteness. So um, I will uh, always uh, work with control inputs which will have bounded amplitude. That was my premise. So in uh, terms of the control assumptions, there are two relevant ones. The first, as I said, bounded control amplitudes that will never allow uh, delta functions uh, uh, to appear. And what will turn out to be a very important um, uh, design principle for DCG, I will allow myself the possibility for a given gate to be implemented, let's say, with different speed. And this can be practiced by for instance, imagining that given a control profile or a shape that we like, a rectangular uh, is the simplest one, but we don't have to. In fact, we might want for practical reason to have finite rise times and so on and so forth. But the important thing is like, uh, I assume that we are going to be able to uh, stretch and rescale the amplitude uh, by achieving the same gate uh, that I want, okay? All right, so once again, the objective in DCG construction, DCGs are uh, composite quantum gates. This is very much in line with many other construction or gadget in fault tolerance. We have faulty components that we call primitive gates, and we are putting them in sequence back to back so that if we are doing this game right, the net error that we are going to have from the decoherence acting wind at the end of the sequence will be smaller than uh, with respect to the original error that a primitive implementation would have suffered from. So I don't think it's uh, appropriate for me to become uh, very technical here, but the basic idea is like, well, uh, Daniel was telling us about Dyson series Magnus expansion. These are the same tools that are going to be used in terms of uh, understanding how the given uh, individual blocks with their error per gate, we can cascade these blocks together. We can compute the overall error per gate of the sequence and assuming appropriate convergence condition for Magnus, uh, we can uh, do estimates having in mind the intuition that the basic idea that we are going to follow is the fact that the error per gates as we are cascading faulty blocks don't add up plainly, otherwise game would be over. 
but the fact that I put here this formula to show the fact that the individual error per gates, they each are modulated by the action of the control up to that point. And because, presumably, we know what the control does, this is something that we design, our game is to devise that modulation so that we can gain at the end of the day. So uh, first order dynamically corrected gates are so designed in such a way that uh, we want to start from an uncorrected error per gate that typically will scale linearly with how long the gate will take to achieve. And I will say that first order correction has been achieved if the scaling of the error per gate rather than being linear has been brought down to be quadratic with the basic length that I'm going to call tau. So that's the objective and uh, well, uh, Turns out I won't have the time to give you all the technical details, but the basic idea, or the first step rather, is to learn how to do this uh, by having in mind the simplest possible quantum gate, which is the identity gate, which is do nothing. It's quite instructive, in fact, to do nothing in control theory. Um, so um, how to perform an effective uh, no op gate with only uh, bounded control, which means having access to uh, primitive segments. Uh, well, that actually uh, we already knew before I started um, actually working on this problem. I had already solved this problem with Manny. And uh, this has to do with the form of decoupling, which Daniel didn't have the time to cover, unfortunately, which is Eulerian dynamical decoupling. And uh, uh, well, this still uses groups, but it also makes reference to the generator of the group. And here is the fact that the primitive gates uh, that are those, uh, think of them as the resources you have in the lab and the ones that you can implement in a faulty way, they correspond to the generator of a certain decoupling group. And uh, there is a recipe which has to do with um, applying this generator by following a certain path on the Cayley graph that represents this group so that, well, the details I can explain in detail, but so that if this is done right, uh, the error at the end of the path turns out to exactly do uh, what we wanted it to do. So namely, the first order error is canceled and we are left with second order contribution. This picture here is the most important one as far as we are considering linear decoherence. So if we consider linear decoherence on qubit, the group is the one that uh, Daniel mentioned, the Pauli group. Uh, imagine that uh, uh, each of the Pauli operation is applied collectively as a product like x, for instance, means x1 tensor xn, uh, and n is the number of qubits we have. And uh, uh, these generators can be implemented by having access to collective Hamiltonian in this way. Turns out that this is the um, Euler, this is the Cayley graph at each vertex we put um, a, an element of the group and then we join these at the edges of this graph are meant to be like the control operation that take us from one agent, that take us from one element to the other. So my way to read this graph at least in terms of control recipe is that we are given here two sets of Hamiltonian, the, the collective along X and the collective along Y. And if I apply them in this order, so X, Y, 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 X, Y, X, this is an Euler cycle which uses each edge once and only once. By this symmetry property, we can prove that the error is uh, second order with respect to the uh, duration of the individual segment we started. Uh, from. Of course, the length is multiplied by two, so this is uh, per se uh, length eight, but we can do this uh, by keeping the uh, control amplitude finite at all time. Now, uh, that's not exactly what I want to do here at all, because at the end of the game I have done a free I, I have done a no op with less error. What I want to achieve is a generic gate and in the beginning, Kava and I were scratching our heads because uh, we were kind of thinking that maybe this wouldn't be possible to achieve. Um, 
So uh, it is uh, possible to prove, in fact, that uh, one property that uh, decoupling has is the fact that the cancellation of the error happens as long as we are using the same uh, generator to implement uh, given a Metonian along the cycle. It doesn't really matter uh, how the generator is implemented. So basically, it's a control oblivious implementation for which the cancellation happens no matter what. This kind of control oblivious cancellation, unfortunately, doesn't extend to more general quantum gates. So for a while, we thought that maybe that wasn't working. However, on um, better thinking to the problem, it is possible to evade this no-go uh, theorem for black box uh, error cancellation by realizing that it is still possible, even though we might not know, and in fact we won't know, the individual error per gates of our primitive segments, it is still going to be able to enforce relationship between that, between them. And this is the idea that uh, has taken us from NOP to a modified construction for constructing DCGs, and uh, it uh, has to do with um, finding uh, the basic intuition here is like, uh, suppose we succeed, and I will show you that this is possible in the next slide, suppose that we succeed at finding two uh, particular sequence of primitive gates that we call balance pairs, um, that for the given target we want to achieve, they have the property that they share the same error up to the first order, but one of them, uh, does achieve the target gate, the other uh, does nothing. It's a special identity gate, uh, but notice that um, it carries an error, and this is the same error that the Q star gate carries. So if we succeed at finding such a construction, then what I can do, imagine that I take the uh, graph I had before, and at each of the four uh, vertices I attach an identity. Well, in that case, I will still have done an identity overall by just taking longer. So that doesn't seem a smart idea. However, if at one of these uh, edges, I go in afterwards, and instead of doing one of these IQ gate, I perform the Q star, by definition, or better, by the fact that I have chosen this balance pair to share the same error, I will not change the error cancellation properties of this construction, but now the net result of the game is going to be that I will affect the target gate with a lesser error. So that's the idea underlying TCGs, and I apologize if this is very uh, quick. In any case, the key uh, constructing ingredient is to make sure that balance pairs exist, and that the fact that they exist well, the key insight is to realize that uh, there, there basically the error per gate is going to depend upon how we are going to implement the gates. And uh, uh, we can map out and exploit the relationship between primitive error per gate in such a way that we do succeed at finding a combination with same error. These are two uh, specific constructions which have uh, let me just describe briefly the uh, naive balance pairs, that we, as we call it. In this case, remember, we assume uh, access to stretchable and uh, in additionally uh, control profile where I can also design. If this is the case, and the basic mathematical fact is like if I consider a control Hamiltonian and then I rescale and stretch uh, the error action gets rescaled by exactly the same factor. That's the key thing. Well, in this case, if you consider a two rectangular profile, each of which take two tau, but one of them has this form and this other one has this, well, uh, they share the same error to leading order in the duration tau. However, this one achieves nothing. It does an identity. This other one achieves Q. So this is a first example of naive uh, balance pair. Naive because we use the fact that the control are reversible. This construction can be improved at the expenses of allowing three control uh, slots for first order correction uh, by 
uh, what we call a portable set of balance pairs and the common that uh, we are going to use is instead this. So the bottom line is like, uh, if we are willing to make sequence longer, we can succeed at getting first order uh, corrected gates. And uh, with the general construction of balance pair, the time overhead that we have is eight was the length of the cycle. And then we have uh, three for each times four, which becomes 20 uh, times tau uh, in the presence of arbitrary linear decoherence. Um, this is the most technical part, and I would just uh, state the results in case you are uh, curious. Well, it is possible to achieve correction beyond the first order, and the technique of concatenation was mentioned already quite a few times. The idea is the same, uh, although there are some technical steps that are involved. Um, but basically, it is possible, and uh, we call it dynamically corrected gates, it is possible to recursively um, embed low order DCGs as components for Euler cycles and balance pair. And uh, by following these algorithms, uh, come up with constructions uh, which are able, uh, at least uh, in principle, to arbitrarily suppress the effect of decoherence as we are generating gates. Now, the error bound is a little bit technical to derive, but the message is that after M level of concatenation, as we would like it to be, the overall error of the sequence scales uh, as the basic combination of the norm of the error Hamiltonian times the basic duration M plus one. And M equals zero is the physical layer as we were uh, seeing this morning in some of the tutorial talks. So just like, uh, in concatenated DD, also in the action, there is an optimal concatenation level, but let me move on. Uh, and, uh, um, well, illustration here, this is a single qubit case um, that uh, we had uh, studied. It's a single qubit couple to a uh, simple uh, si spin bath. And uh, we have it exemplified here uh, what would happen for the uncorrected gates, which are uh, the blue line first order, second order, third order, and the only thing that I want to emphasize, aside from the technical details, uh, is the fact that as we increase the concatenation level in this system, the slope, although it's not a slope, it's a logarithmic uh, plot, but uh, we are getting more and more error cancellation in spite of the fact that the length of the sequence becomes longer. And I would like to point out in particular that at this point here, the improvement of fidelity between this black and the blue, many as 13 orders of magnitude, in spite of the fact that the length has been going up quite a bit, because I don't know if you can read, but this is the third order, and it is more than 8,000 durations with respect uh, to the primitive segments. I would also like to emphasize, and this ties in directly with John's previous talk and Mike's comment. I actually had the same comment I wanted to make. Um, there has been a, a recent experiment uh, being performed in the group by Chris Monroe and David uh, Hayes is not here, but has been the uh, first author of this paper here, where basically um, there has been a composite gay sequence aimed at obtaining better uh, Milmer Sorensen gates in trapped ion and better meaning uh, to uh, protective or to achieve more robustness uh, in the presence of an uh, unknown uh, parameter that enters as a dim error in, um, in these gates and whose consequence, detrimental consequence, would be to cause residual entanglement at the end of the gate between the spin and emotional degrees of freedom. Now, what I want to say, and uh, the details are, well, they didn't do this experiment having the CDCG framework in mind, but it turns out and the details are in this joint paper up here, that this uh, experimental implementation can be interpreted, in fact, as a step towards implementing CDCGs uh, in the presence of a particularly favorable uh, error model, which has nice properties, nice algebraic properties. And the data that you see in this paper here, they clearly reveal a change 
of slope, even though there is still a lot of scatter uh, in data, but they reveal a change in slope from the uncorrected versus some form of composite uh, uh, sequence gate designed having uh, this type of ideas of modulation in mind. Okay, uh, let me at least <laughs> get to the beginning of what would be uh, the next steps. Let me uh, summarize um, what we have so far. So concatenated dynamical gates, they have a lot of good features, I believe. So in particular, they give us a proof of principle uh, construction that arbitrarily accurate decoherence suppression during gates is possible. And uh, uh, this is based uh, completely on open loop control. It doesn't require feedback, doesn't require ancillary resources. The constructions are very portable because I haven't made the specific assumptions on the environment other than they have, of course, uh, cut off and they are bounded in norms. The constructions are fully analytic and we could even consider to concatenate further with consequences so that we can uh, fight simultaneously decoherence and systematic control error. So that's the pluses, but there are minuses. And uh, the minuses is like, for instance, I have forgotten or I have uh, um, assumed that the system Hamiltonian could be uh, ignored. That was my driftless assumption. Turns out that uh, this is uh, an oversimplification of the problem uh, because uh, in some typical control scenarios, we actually need the system Hamiltonian to synthesize the primitive gates in the first place. So in those situations where the gate synthesis becomes itself uh, complex, um, the challenge uh, becomes also to construct uh, balanced pairs, so how do we go about it? That's bad, but not so bad. Another <laughs> um, bad feature, of course, is the fact that I have mentioned concatenation. Concatenation also in this comes with overheads, which can be and typically will be exponential in the sense that even for a single qubit, the length of the sequence grows exponentially with concatenation level, and I haven't shown that to you, but if we were to consider a many qubit with an adversarial error model, well, in that case, uh, we would also have, although one could argue the adversarial model is not exactly realistic in many situations, but in that case, we would also have exponential growth with system size. Now, um, there are ways out uh, that we can uh, try to mitigate these factors, and uh, the starting point for that is to uh, realize that uh, uh, basically what the framework for dynamically corrected gates is, is a constructive reci recipe for determining a solution to two targets simultaneously. First of all, we want to be able to control Hamiltonian uh, that generates the desired target gate up to a certain phase, which is irrelevant. So this is a gate synthesis constraint. And secondly, we want to do that, uh, depending on which order we want to suppress error, we want to, achieve, we want to achieve this synthesis while canceling this error up to the desired power. And uh, the CDCG framework tells us to do so as long as uh, we can achieve perfect perfect synthesis in the absence of the error Hamiltonian, and we are able to identify that's the key point, a systematic relationship between the control and the error for each segment. However, uh, in reality, it is also true that the more detail we have about the error model and the control specification, the need that I have emphasized a lot for portable construction that make minimal refer specific of the system can be relaxed. And this paves the way for optimizing this construction for a specific error scenario and system of interest. So basically, uh, and this will underlie zero minutes, negative, okay. Um, this will underlie or would underlie the two examples I wanted to show is to rely on numerical search methods to solve one or both of these problems by restricting the control variables uh, within the admissible uh, domain that we have. So, um, well, I would not 
uh, I don't have actually time to tell you the detail, but the two problems for which we have, uh, I would say, encouraging our results along this way is, um, I, I think the step is like we are trying to tackle the, this two problem of driftless assumption in that construction and also improve the efficiency one at a time. So uh, it is possible to uh, first uh, um, keep the driftless assumption and then try to use numerical search algorithm to get more efficient gates. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, I had the data that I wanted to show you on the simplest control scenario, which is single qubit, but pure defacing. Mm -hmm. And uh, turns out that the general recipe was 365 tau for second order. And uh, with numerical search, it can be brought down to as little as 21 uh, durations here. Uh, and that's the numerically optimized performance with respect to the uncorrected. And the one, that's the one you, sh you saw before. And then um, lastly, uh, it is also possible to uh, accommodate the pre of a non-zero system Hamiltonian, so a drift term. Um, but uh, we have started looking at this problem, focusing, we're going back to first order dynamically corrected gate. And uh, uh, I also wanted to uh, show you the result, but probably I can leave this for um, discussion, given that there is no time. Let me just conclude with a uh, uh, set of remarks that I want to nevertheless make. Um, I think that uh, although this is not a full-fledged uh, solution to fault tolerance, dynamical approaches to quantum error correction, they do have the potential to reduce physical gate errors below the levels that are required by fault tolerant constructions. And there is lots of work that is uh, ongoing in this direction. I didn't have much of a chance to show you the numerical results. However, I want to stress that there is really plenty of room to make DCGs bad terms of optimizing their performances against specific error modeling, specific control scenarios. And uh, uh, from that point of view, one of the steps that I think is truly necessary to make is to make more contact with optimal control theory approaches. And for many qubit settings, also to better incorporate the uh, physical properties of the error models, such as locality, sparsity, and all of that. Lastly, and this is where I would really conclude, um, we have seen a lot, an impressive number of experimental um, demonstration, realization, and benchmarking of dynamical decoupling. Um, I think it's really important also that we are going to uh, look carefully at dedicated experimental realizations of dynamically corrected gates. Uh, we are already have mentioned one, even though that was not intended, but turns out to be. And in that context, I like to, well, this is just advertising, uh, working together with uh, Mike, uh, Dirsek, and Amir Jacobi in Harvard. And hopefully our plan is to really try to investigate, as part of this collaboration, um, scrutinize the viability of this approach, both in trapped ions and uh, quantum dots. And with that, I'd like to conclude, and thank you for your attention. Maybe time for one or at most two questions. Uh, And so have you considered the possibility of combining the Ulrich dynamic decoupling with uh, this, uh, and so that it can suppress to the high order while also doing some non-trivial quantum gates? You are referring to the fact that the uh, procedure we have used is exponential in length because of the concatenation. So, well, um, yes and no. We have been thinking too, but uh, the problem right now is that even for just uh, uh, the target of doing an arbitrary order accurate no op. So forget about the generic gate, just wanting to do uh, identity. Um, to the best of my knowledge, we don't know how to extend that to arbitrary order. So Euler decoupling can be made into symmetric. Euler decoupling, there is also work by Uric himself uh, on uh, uh, realistic Uric dynamical decoupling, but that goes uh, to suppression of second order uh, with bounded amplitude. So we don't have a recipe for that yet. So that would be the first step. 
And probably if that can be achieved, the next challenge would be um, to evade the no-go and, and come up with, with good balance pairs, if any. Okay. Thank you. So uh, time for one more question. Okay, well if not, let's thank uh, Lorenzo again. Thanks. <laughs>